So do I hit continue? All right, I'm gonna give my consent to be recorded. Okay. Uh, consent is so important, kids. Eliza Schlesinger, you're talking to maybe a hundred college students right now. My first question Hello, is children. about you, <laughs> you in college, because I know you were, went to Emerson, but we're also in Texas for one year, and I know you were involved with comedy. What was your uh, strategy in college to try to maximize your college experience? Maximize college experience. Uh, I'm from Texas. I went to the University of Kansas and to someone from California, oh. those two might not be different. Uh, but sorry, I, sorry. no, that's okay. And I went to, it's really not that interesting. I hate having to correct people on things that aren't interesting. Uh, but uh, for edification. Uh, and I went to Emerson and I, I mean, talking to kids who go to USC and the USC field program, very coveted. I myself tried to get into it. Um, I think doing the things that you want to be doing because at no other time in your life will it be as stress-free. So I was in a sketch troupe, which sounds like a jerk off session, but it really was. We worked so hard and our sketch troupe was a very big deal and it meant so much to us. And it was one of the few chances that, you know, if you're lucky enough, you don't have a job and you can throw your heart into it with other people who are like-minded and you can form relationships in theory with people that you might work with in the future. Not so much in my case, but, um, it's your chance to make that film, to be creative uh, and unbridled in a way that you probably won't have as you get older because life will take over. Um, so you can join a dance troupe or a step class. I tried to play rugby for a semester. That was really uh -huh. hard. I joined the lacrosse <laughs> team. That was too much of a commitment. Like that's what college is for. Kiss a bunch of girls, do whatever you wanna do. You can always change your mind, so. Right. And at that point, did you know you were going to do stand-up comedy? I knew, I always knew I was going to be funny for a living. Um, mm -hmm. And so being in that sketch troupe, you know, and I did, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I went to a small private school. So I did improv there and you're cobbling together, you know, I had, uh, I didn't have an older sibling and my dad wasn't in the house, like showing me here, you should watch Caddyshack. Here are the things you should do. So I was very much cobbling together my own education whatever I could get my hands on without knowing what was cool. I liked Absolutely Fabulous. I liked Kids in the Hall, um, of course, SNL at the time, and Living Color when I was younger, and all these random things that no one's telling you, and there wasn't a discussion about men are, aren't funny, and women aren't funny, and you can't do this. You know, it was different back then, so I was just kind of on my own, piecing things together, reading, I don't have the books here in the other room, like just any comedy book I could get my hands on, and, uh, so I, and then I took that and when I got to Emerson and I met all these kids that were like me because none of my friends were like me in high school. They all went on to be like doctors and lawyers. What then about a Kansas? What about Kansas? Were there, Kansas, you, you know, they had a film program and I, they had this one program where you could get a grant and make a film. And I was like, what do I have to do? I think I wrote my script on a word document. I had never heard of final draft. There is a beauty to not knowing that you can't do something. I didn't know you couldn't write a script on a Word document paragraph by paragraph. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I couldn't do, so I just did it. And as you get older, people tell you all the things you can't do and all the rules. But I think because I started with no rules and no one having an interest in me and me just making it up, I think now when I hear rules, when you hear things like, oh, Warner Brothers doesn't do deals with FX, you're like, why? Oh, here at Netflix, we don't do these. I'm like, this isn't physics. It's some executive saying no. Right. The answer is there are no no's. Because someone will tell you no, but then for another comic, it'll be yes. It's all made up and it's all bullshit. So do whatever you want. <laughs> all right. I'm going to ask you a question. You're a kid. You're watching In Living Color. You're watching Kids in the Hall. You're watching SNL. You're watching uh, these great sketch shows. Could you imagine that these years later that you would have your own sketch show that you're the star of on the number one streaming platform in the world, in our honestly, world. Honestly, Wayne, I thought it would have happened sooner. And, okay, uh, yeah, I love it, I love it. I also, you know, and I did like a lot of funny people did, I wrote my own sketches. I would get my girlfriends and we would rewrite the SNL sketches and make our own funny sketches. You know, I had uh -huh. one of those camcorders and we, I, I would edit it, edit it in camera and I downloaded my own editing software and taught myself all these things. And a lot of kids did that, you know, and this was before YouTube, before Lonely Island. I'm sounding like so old, but this was just, you're doing it with what you have. Um, but I always knew to answer your question that I was going to be funny for a living. 
And I never really cared <clears throat> how that took shape. It was just that I did sketch in college. And then I was kind of like, you know what? I write so many of these sketches. I think I can just say what I need to say without an ensemble. So mm -hmm. it kind of just evolved into that. And then, you know, it morphed into back into the sketch. And now I'm going to go do more stand up. So just the right. ability to get to be funny on your own terms is what now, we strive for. Now, when you were for. doing those sketches in college, how does that compare to now? You having full production, shooting in New York, seven weeks, six shows. Yeah. How is the reality of it compared to your dream of it as a kid? Well, I think when you're doing, I mean, you're doing stuff in college, you, there's no real money for it. And it's right. all like run and gun, guerrilla style. You also don't have the technique. You don't have the makeup. And there is like, I have such a fondness for that memory, you know, like, oh, really? we went to someone's cabin so we could use the canoe at their parents' cabin in upstate New York. And we did a bunch of mushrooms and we wore a bunch of costumes and there's a, a community there. And with the sketch show, you know, you ideally you're hiring your friends. We shot this in a city that I don't live in. So you're hiring just funny people. So it's less like that troop feeling. Mm -hmm. It's less of a comedy troupe, which is its own special thing. Um, and more my show hiring these actors. Um, but it was a lot of fun. It was. Okay. And when you're shooting these sketches, like I, I watched the show, it's just, it just debuted, right? Uh, like a April 1st. Weeks. April 1st. So it's already Go been. Go watch it. Yeah. 12 days um, or 10 days, 10 days. It doesn't so, matter. No, it's. I, time has no, time has no meaning. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. So when you're shooting all these sketches and you're thinking you're doing these characters, were the, any of them from back then or are they all new no. or are they just from years of doing these characters? You know, something I would, uh, some of them were brand new. We came up with them in the writer's room. But, uh -huh. you know, as you go along in this career, you will have little kernels of ideas that you just can never let go of. Um, I can tell you that two of them, the Nectarine Conference Room, for anyone yeah. that's seen it, it's a conference call and everyone's eating nectarines. That came from a couple of years ago when everybody was racing to make digital platforms. ABC had a digital platform called ABCD. Yeah. And they gave me a show called Forever 31, which I wrote. We did like six episodes. And I wrote a season two of it and then the network folded. Uh, but in that season two, I had written about a conference call. And while it wasn't about the Nectarine one, I had this idea because nobody pays attention on a conference call. Everybody's doing something else. So I took that right. idea and I brought it there. Um, and I was like, let's do something with this. And then there was, even though it's not a sketch anybody talks about, there's a sketch on the show called Nude Tone Bike Shorts. And it's about men wearing yeah, oh, black yeah. colored. And it's supposed to be really gross. And I wanted to do that sketch on a late night show that I had called um, Truth and Eliza on Freeform. Sounds like a tampon is actually a network for women. And the executives at the time said, no, it's too weird for women. You can't address them that way. And I remember thinking that's such bullshit because people love to, women love to put caps on feminism. Like here's how women can or can't receive information. I was like, really, we can't do weird things. They were like, no. And I was like, I'm gonna make that sketch. So we made it. It's not a fan favorite, but we made it because I really liked it. I love it. <laughs> it seems gun. like, yeah. I, now that I'm just talking to you, that you've always been sort of creating content. Even today, you did a cooking show an hour before you did this. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. You've got to. You know, I remember being in a sketch troupe, and mm -hmm. I remember writing sketches, and I remember a friend of mine was in it, and she didn't really write sketches. And I remember thinking like, are you just waiting around hoping that one of the guys writes something for you? And I remember having, I knew someone who was on SNL and she was talking about having a writer. And I was like, do you not generate your own idea? She was like, no, but, and I'm like, no, you're just a sitting duck. Then you're putting your fate in someone else's hands and no one's ever gonna look out for just you. They're looking out for themselves. So if they can't write a funny sketch for you, they're not losing sleep over it. You have to self-generate in stand up. I mean, it's all you, my industry, my own, my business is built around just me. So it's that fine line of giving yourself a break, but also reinventing self-generating and always putting out quality content. Cause I never just want to have it on me. And I'm just, you know, you're just watching me do nothing and make funny faces. You want, I try to be as judicious as possible. Come on, there's a dog under me. Hello. Oh, speaking of quality content. 
Of course, of course. But yeah, and it, you know, you also, I self-generate because there are gonna be plenty of days where the phone doesn't ring and people say no. And it's like, do you go home and cry and eat a bunch of cookies? Yes, but then you go write something. And I just shot a film, we got a green light from Universal. I'm sorry, we got yep. a distribution deal from Universal. And we just wrapped it and we did picture, I mean, it's done. And uh, that movie was written during these last several years, every time somebody said no. And people say no to me a lot. Every time I come home from a show or weekend, I would chip away at that sketch, at the script. And then one day I found the right producer. And so it's just this kind of like this, this glorified self-loathing that a lot of comics have yeah. in this business. We're like, I guess I'll just give up. Yeah, please give up. Go home because there's someone else to take your spot and you're creating traffic. So right. make your time on this planet count. Oh. A lot. I think that's great advice for these kids that are listening, these young adults. Let's put it that way, these young adults listening. Yeah, and young, young adults. Young, hot I adults. Know. Young, hot adults. I can only see their names at this point. But you can tell they're they, hot. By their names? You can tell Amber Miller's hot. You can tell. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> These weird black you know, boxes here. I don't know. Yeah, there's nothing there. There's, I think she has a, a face. All right, now uh, you're also, I couldn't have enjoyed your performance in Spencer Confidential more. Did you know when you were shooting that, that that was so in the pocket for you? Or were you just like, oh, this is shocking. I'm just, because I know they brought you back for reshoots and they beefed up your part. They beefed but you don't, Yeah. Um... You know, when you are a comedian or when you're a funny yeah. person, you know yeah. when you're doing well. Right. You know when you have an audience and you know when you're comfortable. And I think comedy comes from comfort. It's We've all been in those rooms or those green rooms where like you say something and people, are, they don't want to hear it. It's really hard to be funny when you don't have that chemistry with someone or when you're not comfortable with the other comic. Um, right. That's why comics hire their friends and writers rooms are filled with friends because you want to have that flow and not be like, oh, did I say something? Do they not like me? Are they jealous? Like it gets so weird. Um, on set, I was so nervous. And it really? is really a test. Yeah, because you don't get like a day with Mark Wahlberg to like feel each other out. Like you are there, he is there, you know he's gonna know his lines and you better know yours. Like I just thought to myself, like, please just don't be the reason that this movie is bad. Like, please just don't be the reason they yell cut. Like I just, you know, and it's a testament to Peter Berg, our director and Mark Wahlberg. They created just by being professional and being good at what they do, a space where I was comfortable to try stuff. Peter from the get go was like, you're here because you're funny and I like you. He created a space so that I was comfortable joking around. And Mark was so good at improvising. He's not a trained, like UCB improviser, but he knows when to hang back, when to say something, he doesn't talk over. And so creating that space. Um, conversely, I've been on movie sets where they talk all day about like, it's okay, we're actors, let's all just fail and try. And you're terrified because they make it so uncomfortable. And on this movie, it, it was, it starts from number one on the call sheet down and, and the director and it was just comfortable. And I knew that I was there because I was funny. I wasn't there for another reason. So. Well, you, well, again, I'm seeing it from someone. I don't know what was left on the floor yeah. and stuff like that. But I just felt like every scene you were right in the pocket in that movie. It's also, it thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. You. All right. I just. Uh, it's it. it's a pretty intense movie too. Like Sissy is, for those of you that haven't seen, like she is south boston so right there you know she's not like a quiet librarian and the scenes are she's in his face she's yelling at him because he didn't come see her they're having right. sex in the bathroom they're having a fight or there's an argument so we don't there's only one moment that's really calm it's at the end when they're eating even when they're walking on the beach they're kind of snipping at each other so we didn't have any of those luxurious moments so i wanted to make sure i gave her level so that she wasn't just up here the whole time um and there's like a whole energy idea to it or whatever, but uh, I just tried to throw back whatever Mark threw at me. And I just tried to make sure I made the most of it and made sure that she wasn't just this one dimensional girl. Cause it's very easy to just be like the girlfriend in an action movie. Right. And I'm right. not hot enough for that. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Come on. Can we circle back to something you said earlier about being comfortable on a set and that's the best way to create comedy? for yeah. you. And when now when you're running this sketch show, 
are you aware of that, that you want to create that environment for the other people? I am hyper aware of that, you know, having done, I don't remember when we did those reads, but having shot Spencer Confidential, and I really wasn't in that many other movies, but I remember I did Instant Family and Sean yep. Anders, who directed that, really nice guy. I mean, I was like 12th on the call sheet and he was super approachable. You know, you don't want to talk your director's ear off, but these people get set my the example for me of how to conduct yourself on a set. Being a movie star isn't showing up blitzed out of your mind, yelling at people. And I have been on set with those types of people and it wreaks havoc on morale, on energy, everything. So having had these lovely experiences, I wanted to create that similar set. I learned so much from being around these consummate professionals. I wanted people to, my mom's FaceTiming me and I told her I was doing this. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted people to be happy to be coming to work because I was so lucky to get the show. Uh, so that means that even if you're having a bad day, don't take it out on your crew. Don't have a bad attitude. Suck it up because you're getting to do a job that very few people get to do and most people would kill to get to do. Um, and I wanted people to be excited that they were working on the show for, for you know, many reasons, um, mostly because I was excited and there's, there's no bad days. You're going to make your own show, your own movie, you're in a movie, you are accomplishing something that a very small fraction of performers get to do. Uh, and it doesn't make you look cool to have a bad attitude. It doesn't make you look like more of a celebrity. And so just keeping that in mind, I'm too old to like show up and like drive the wrong way on the 405. Like it's not cute anymore. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, when I go on Netflix, it seems like you have a whole wing of just your stuff from your, your there's five stand up specials. There's a, your, there's a movie yeah. you're in. There's obviously that sketch show. What does that yeah. feel like? Does it feel like you're having a moment or do you feel like you're still scrambling as you always were? I'm it's still scrambling. Wow. And, I, and people get so mad. I mean, you're a comic, you get it. People get so, because those things are, I mean, that first Netflix special was like 2016. So it's been this drawn out thing. Um, and it's not a, people was like, why can't you just be happy with what you have? It's like, that's not what we signed up for. We didn't move all the way to LA to rest on our laurels and do one thing. Um, I, I just don't think that's the kind of person I am. And if I was, then I wouldn't, I guess be me. It's nice to have those specials, but yeah. all I think about is like, who else has five specials? When's my sixth one? Wow. And I think that's just part of, and that doesn't mean you can't enjoy it, you know, but maybe I don't feel as fulfilled as I could be one day. I think I'll get there. I think it's just not now. I think like right now is very much go time. Does that make you're sense? Still, you're still, yeah, it sounds like you're just still churning. You've got to because there's, tell me. And, People always say, they're like, don't compare yourself to other people. Children, listen to me, okay? Those people are lying to you. All those self-help people, all the people that are on panels, like, don't compare yourself. Don't do it too much because you'll drive yourself crazy because there's always someone better than you. But that's in a race. Like, that's how you know you need to speed up because you can feel someone, their breath on your neck. Um, you don't have to actively harm anyone but just know like if you let up there is someone there to take your place and you don't have to be replaceable but you know why did you get into this and uh if your goal is to create there are going to be a lot of hurdles in your way telling you that you can't create so every day is this marathon of just jumping over those no's those passes those we're going to put a pin in you all these things that you've got to like forge through with muscle and just decide that what you have to say is important and you're not going to let someone who doesn't get you say no. I didn't get into USC. I didn't get to Emerson the first time I applied. And I let that deter me. I wouldn't have gone to school. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So what do you, what do you think? Just can we just circle back to a little to your own motivation? So you, you deal with all these setbacks, getting pinned and stuff like that. What do you think has helped you and advice you could give to these, oops, these young uh, adults on how to power through those moments. And what's okay. worked for you? What's worked for you? Let me tell you this, because you're yeah. so young right now, and I know that young people hate hearing that. They hate it, which like, I would love to hear, feel like I'm so young. Cause I remember right. when people used to say that to me and like, no one says that anymore. Like I'm 37, <laughs> but no one's like, you're young, you've got time. And they're like, no, you might want to freeze the eggs. So, um, so much energy right now, kids. 
and you have the means to live in a shitty situation and not feel shitty. Like you in your twenties can be poor, live in an apartment with eight other dudes uh, or chooks and be a gopher. And like, you still feel like you're on top of the world. So use that energy now. Uh, because if somebody, if I had nothing and tomorrow someone's like, you need to start stand up comedy right now, it would be too daunting a task. It's exhausting. Lay your groundwork now. And that groundwork for you, watch as many movies as you can, take in as much as you can. People, unless you're a genius, people probably aren't gonna wanna read what you're writing, but it might get you like a writer's assistant thing. Have a great attitude. That is the best advice I can give you. Nobody cares. Like USC is such a prestigious school and it will get you in the door. But like beyond that, the executive there like doesn't care that you went there. Be the person on set or in an office that people go to for things. Make sure they know your name. Wear a fucking funny hat. So we're like, guy in the purple hat, he's always cool. Have a great attitude and ask people that you respect. Be like, can I take you to coffee and just pick your brain? Ask for advice. Do not DM me after this because I cannot see you. Whoever's in your office, the head of the company, ask if you can sit in on meetings. Show that you want to learn and you want to be there. Those are the people that get brought in that they want to have. People have people on sets that they want to have on set. Nobody's going to have you on set just because your dad is someone or because you did something at school. Be, have a great attitude and show that you want to be there. I mean, on our um, sketch show, we had this PA named Zach. And he's just a PA that was assigned to me as a personal PA. He was so on it, had such a great attitude, was such a delight to be around that if we get a season two, I will request him and we will try to give him more responsibility. Production, you know, it's this, it's a ladder you have to climb. People want to be around people, other actors that are easy to work with, that show up on time, that are early, that know their lines. So much of this business is what other people think about you. Um, and, you know, put your ego aside. You're in your 20s. Just go out there eat shit for a little bit and just know that like you have no wrinkles. <laughs> so it'll be okay. Good. That's my best uh, piece of advice. That was awesome. That was awesome. Let me ask you this. Uh, Cause there are some students here who aren't in, not only in cinema, but are also in dramatic arts. We're interested in comedy. Can we just talk a little about, I heard you say this once, these two things. And it really surprised me that you don't really write a lot except on stage yeah. Well, let's start, and then I'll, I have a follow up for that when you're done. Is that true? I don't write and then write and then read and go on stage. I talk it out on stage. So that is true. Um, and that's it. Like, I don't have like a document in my, on my computer that's like, you don't new have jokes. A, you don't have a set list, a piece of paper with like bullet points? Uh, yeah. Oh. On occasion, I, I think I have one here. Um, oh, okay. But that's less. That's jotting down like sweater, rhinoceros, just to trigger, and then eventually yeah. you get rid of the paper. But yeah. I don't write, I know I have the, one here. I don't, um, in my own office, I, is it in here? Nope. I don't write out, some comics sit and they write at their laptop. I don't do that, right. it's all on stage. And mostly memorized, um, but I do have like scraps. My early 20s is just replete with shreds of paper, gum wrappers that just have things like traffic, pizza, just like words, like serial killer grocery list. I think I'm going to find one. Anyway, that's the answer. I just want to say to our U USC students, uh, we're yeah. about to uh, open this up for some Q&As as well. So have your questions ready. What do you have there? What do you have for us? Here's some old set list. This is an old desk. This would be the set list I use. And then sometimes I'd hold on to them for like weeks at yeah. a time and not even uh -huh. look at them. Anyway, uh, pyramid, old at table, hit and run car chase. This is a bunch of jokes that never made it to the last special. Um, and it's on uh, an improv VIP right, right, reserve right, table right, list. Right, right, right. Uh, body glitter, one hour glitter. I, so this could be, anyways, the point is, as you're crafting the hour, I'll jot down tiny things to remind myself. And then the last several months going into it, there's no paper. And the okay. other question I had for you that I heard you say once is that you feel when you do your stand-up show that the music they play as the crowd is coming in is part of the show. Can you speak to that if that's true? Yes. I believe when you buy a ticket to come and see my show, mm -hmm. you are getting a show from the second you walk into that auditorium to the second you leave. It's an all-encompassing experience. Um, so for Elder Millennial, the tour, the last tour, 
we had an elder millennial playlist and we got all the bands from the early 2000s that were on it to tweet it. So we have like 14,000 followers for that Spotify playlist. If you go on Spotify now, I just got verified, no big deal. We have the 2020 Forever Tour official playlist. And these are songs I put on, they're songs that I enjoy listening to that sort of invoke a certain feeling. I want people when they're in this to feel pumped up, excited, and to feel, you know, it's just like when you go to see any concert, any Vegas show, like they get you from the second you walk in. When you meet me for VIP, I am smiling. I am pumped to see you. I take it very seriously that somebody has spent their money on allowing me to entertain them. Uh, and I want it to be a 360 approach. Uh, the staff is really nice. My team is really good. So I just want people to know that like we value your dollar. My dollar. Love it. I love yeah. it. Inch, I've never heard another comic say that. Okay, I have one more question, then we're going to open it up a little bit, and then I, I'll sure I'll follow up. And that is, uh, when did you know you had this talent for accents? Because one of my favorite characters I'm reading is, is it Kit Wessel? Am I saying Kip it right? Wazzle. Kit Wazzle. Kit Wessel from Australia. Wazzle. Yeah, like it's that was anyway. But that's beyond. You're doing a Boston thing. You're doing a yeah. Swedish thing. You're go ahead. I don't know. I I. I think every girl that does comedy and acts likes to think they can do Australian and British. Um, <laughs> it's less about the accents and more um, the etymology of words. I love history of words. I like knowing why different cultures as best I can. I'm always fascinated to know why people sound the way that they do, how right. languages get developed, how land gets divided up and where the languages come from. I just think these are things that ground us in our own cultures and I'm endlessly fascinated by other cultures. And so it's really more of a respect of trying to like do them because I like the idea of fitting into a culture wherever you go and you'll never perfectly nail it. Um, and I've always just, I've really been, I'm sort of like sound oriented. Like I do a lot of noises. And when I was a kid, I would always mimic noises. My brother's the same way and sounds, words are just noises. And so Sometimes people will talk to me and I'll repeat back what they said. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not making fun of you. I'm actually just trying to log it in my brain because you sound like an idiot when you do a Boston accent, but it sounds like a New York accent. You sound like you've never been anywhere. And uh, I never want to look like an idiot, I guess. Of course. So. All right. Well, Alex, can we get, I see oh, we already have three participants with him. Yeah, uh, I see. Yeah. Let's, let's do go, it. Let's go ahead and call on uh, Marco. Hi, Marco. Um, you should be unmuted. Hang on a sec. Oh, that's not Marco. No. Oh, oh, that is Marco. I yeah. Hope to God okay, that's go. Marco. Hope to God okay. that's Marco. It is. It is. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for hosting this. And my question is, in the realm of, you know, improvisation, what is the conversation that you have with your director, with your DP, so that you have that freedom and you can improvise and do what you're amazing at, but that there's still a consistency that they can be utilized in editing and in post? Totally. So if it's not your movie and you're not the director, uh, the editing is not something you have to think about. And it's actually a weight off your shoulders because I've done movies that are mine and I've done ones that are others. And when it's not yours, you're just there to do your lines. Um, the conversation with the DP is not one, you know, I'm not this like leading lady. So I'm not having, I wasn't the star of that movie. I do. The one thing you always got to say is don't make me look fat. I like this side better, but hopefully, and be nice to them because they are lighting you, but no one's going to ever light you. I mean, they might light you poorly, but, um, that's the extent of my conversation with that DP from that one. And, you know, you have a conversation with your director about, and I've done a couple movies now, Maybe you go to lunch with them. What's your expectation? You come to a meeting of the minds, how you both see that character and what that director wants from you. You know, Peter liked all the funny stuff. You don't want to get too far away from it and they'll reel you back in. But it's about giving yourself that space. I just did a movie called Pieces of a Woman with Shia LaBeouf, um, directed by Cornell Mondrusco, who is like a favorite indie director. And it was not a funny movie. And there was no room for that improvisation. There was movement that you could do and a look here and there, but I was there to, and I was not there to be funny. So really sort of respecting the director's ideas. And then they kind of let you know, you know, cause they want you to make the material better and make it your own, but you have to be on the same page about who is this character? What are they saying? Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it's a muted. Great cheek. I love it. Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Right, we're going to go to James. All right. 
James, are you with us? Yes, I am. Awesome. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to um, quickly ask, you have a lot of good advice for uh, how, how and why to do things when you're young. Uh, like you, I am an elder millennial. Uh, once I, yeah, I came back to grad school, uh, so I'm, I'm 35, and I, uh, I am wrinkling, and I'm running out of energy. So if, for somebody who's, who's breaking in maybe closer to 40, um, uh, as, I, as I approach that, do you have advice that's, um, for the elder millennials who are- Are you breaking coming? into film production, or is it comedy? Or like, what is it that you want to do? Oh, yes, great. That's so helpful if I gave you information. Um, I'm, I'm an MFA screenwriting student uh, for comedy. You know, I think utilizing your school's contacts, and I think the fact that you are older, I think people are very quick to write off younger people. Sometimes mm. with good reason, I was not, but I, because even when I was talking to you, I was like, this man, no offense, like you don't, I don't, I didn't think you were young. And I remember, <laughs> I remember, um, this is kind of a bad example, but um, I hosted a, sh a, a dating show years ago for CBS, and we had a PA who was like ex military. And he was a little bit older and he really treated the job with so much respect. And I remember thinking, like, I want to give this guy more because he seems so capable of doing more. Now, you're not going to get a job as a PA because you're going through this MFA program. But, you know, you have the life experience to relate to people and write about things that younger people can't. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that I didn't do, I don't enjoy doing colleges as much for stand-up is because the life experiences... I mean, I didn't do them for a while. We're not as relatable. No matter how mature you are in college, you haven't dated or had jobs in the real world or experienced paying taxes, things like that, um, that you can relate to with your elder millennial brethren. Yeah. So I, I say also, since you have less time, be bold, go for it, and let people know why your life experience, like what did you do before this that makes you right to have around an office? You know? Cool. Yeah. Awesome. I would lean Thanks. into that. You sell yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah, of course. I hope that helps. All right, I see we have 12 other people that have questions. Let's do let's this. Do it, I love it. Right, let's go to Abby. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry. That's, that's on we'll Alex. Get, we'll that's, not Alex. Hi, that's not Alex. Yeah, Hi, we got Abby. you now. Okay, cool. Hi. So my question was, is there a moment in your career that you felt like you were discovered? And after that moment, how long after that moment did you go about before you went and got representation for yourself? I don't feel I've ever been discovered and I will tell you why. I mean, I can remember the moment I met my manager who I still have and the manager that I got, uh, I met her at the improv and it was in 2006 or seven. So like mm -hmm. when you were born. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I won last comic standing, which we don't have to get into in 2008. So that was stand-up which is so different than any other thing in comedy for stand-up that was huge because I got to become a headliner versus spending years gritting it out opening for someone mm -hmm. so that was a big moment in terms of career growth but not in terms of discovery like I didn't go on any late night shows like no one really cared because stand-up's not that glamorous mm -hmm. so the discovery moment I don't know but representation can happen at any time are you an actress uh possibly we're figuring it out you always want your reps to come to you. You do not want to do the, you don't want to get the headshots and send it out. Take, and you also, when you're younger, you want the assistant to the rep. You want someone that's around your age and hungry mm -hmm. because you'll go into a big agency yep. and they'll parade out all the partners. And they'll be like, look what we're going to do. And they're going to toss you to the side anyway, unless you're like on a major show. So you want someone that's just as hungry as you, that's mm -hmm. going to pick up the phone and work hard for you and grow together. Um, if, if you're, if you don't have a name yet. So there's a term is called hip pocketed. Mm -hmm. You know, you like, if someone from ICM was like, we like her, let's give her to a junior assistant. You're not signed with us. What can you get on your own? Manager and agent, obviously a different thing. Uh, I would take, I would, I don't know if I'd take a manager or an agent. It's tough. Cause one forms right. you and one just gets you things. So, but that's it. And you can have representation. Just only be aware of the fact that you are giving this person 10% of everything. Yeah. So ask yourself if you need both. Exactly. Um, you might not. Right. Thank I, you. So uh, yeah, no worries. I'm like thinking about all the money that I spent on my <laughs> representation. Yeah. Quick ground. Okay, we only, we only have about 15 minutes left. So, oh my God, that who's was next? So, fast. so we're yeah. on to uh, Roma. Oh. You should be unmuted. Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, so, uh, 
I actually very funny the timing for that question because I was about to ask you about representation too because I was interned at Avalon and so I kind of know. I was gonna say I recognize you. Yeah, we had yes at one time. <laughs> I do and remember you. Yes, I felt so. USC internship program paying dividends <laughs> already. There you go. Um, so I was just wondering uh, if you're in a position like Molly, for for example, and like want to be a creative eventually, but are working as an assistant, how do you suggest um, kind of making it clear that you want to be creative, but also doing, balancing being a good administrative assistant as well? You want to be a creative, like you want to be an executive. Or, or if, you, if you want to be a writer or an actor okay. or something like that. First of all, hopefully you're working for somebody that fosters your dreams and that encourages you. I know that Molly, who you're talking about, works in our office. She was a writer's assistant and she got that job because she went to my manager and said, Eliza has a show. Can I be that? Always, squeaky wheel gets the grease. So you don't want to be annoying, but you always want to ask. You always want to make your intentions clear. Nobody wants to hire someone who they feel is like surreptitious. Like, of course I want to be a manager when you really don't because it's wasting everyone's time. Um, be on as many calls as you can. Always ask, can I get coffee for this person? Can I set up this meeting? Can I uh, be in that writer's room and make friends with the assistance of other people. Cause those are the gatekeepers to that person. Always write your own stuff. You know, if you work in a manager's office and you write something awesome, maybe that manager wants to submit you for something. Your job there comes first. Um, God, I worked in an office and it wasn't even a creative job. It was like something in advertising and I would write sketches and my boss would listen to them. Like he was just a cool dude. So ideally you're, you know, don't get a job at an agency because <laughs> it is, that is like, like power fucking go time. Uh, and they don't want to mess around, but a management company, some sort of production company, go somewhere where there's upward mobility, where they're not just going to stick you in a mailroom. Yeah. Can I just, uh, before we get to the next question, uh, reiterate what you said about uh, intention. I feel like that's such a key to the whole thing. The clarity. Yeah, don't lie. Right? Don't say to them, oh, I want to do this just to impress, you know, your boss, because you might want to be a writer and you don't tell that to your boss and you say you want to be like your boss and then she doesn't think of you in that way. So hopefully you're somewhere where they foster that creativity. Love it. Next. All right. We've got Olivia. Hi, I'm Olivia Singer. Uh, Hi, this Olivia. is awesome. <laughs> so thank you. I thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. <Wayne. laughs> She's not laughing um, at that. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, so my question is, your sketch show on Netflix, once you started paving your way, your platform for yourself became stronger, was this an early on goal that you had for yourself? Um, or was this more spontaneous? I, you know, purpose to do everything at all times. You know, and if you said to me tomorrow, like, we're going to put you on a soap opera, I'll be like, great, I'm going to make it so funny. So I always wanted a sketch show and then stand up became the thing that paid the most dividends to quote Wayne just now. Um, so I kind of tend to go where the energy is. Uh, Netflix offered me the show um, and I had pitched them on other shows as well. And I, 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 I just, it was just like a no brainer. But at the time I was thinking about other shows. So there have been times in my life where I would love the sketch show. I've been trying to do a late night show and, you know, sketch shows don't come along that often. And a, a lot of times they're not that great. Some are really great, but they're few and far between. But I was like, I can, I can do this for sure. So that wasn't something that I was seeking, but that's also show business. Like right. some, some things just maybe had I not pitched something else, I wouldn't have been in the conversation or had they not loved my specials. So creativity begets opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Happy Passover. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah. Happy Passover. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Let's go to Alyssa. Hi. Hello, um, so I am an actor first, but I I'm a freshman in college, and I recently started writing, and I was wondering if you would think it better to try and create my writing while I'm in college, so I can have like free will to do whatever I want with my piece or work on refining it so I can maybe eventually get it produced. You should be doing both, right? You should write it. I mean, look, what you write in college, there's a chance that you're a genius and there's a chance that you've written something great. 
but you're going to be evolving so much. I mean, these next 10 years are so huge just in terms of you are at your most liberal and cloistered right now in college. And so, and you're going to change so much as you get out into the real world. So, and by the way, your piece could be about having cancer and I've got nothing to say about that. Like, I don't know what it's about. Keep writing because it just begets better writing and you get better at it. Have people look at it, get insight, full well knowing that that's probably not going to be the thing, but the 15th iteration of that from that rude idea might be the thing. So, and we're living in a different world now because there's so much online content and creators can be so visible. Um, I would also just not have an ego about it because you are there to learn and be around all these people that are like-minded just to absorb as much as you can constantly be polishing my stand-up is only what it is because we happen to film it on that one day but it's ever evolving and your scripts would be ever evolving too if you didn't have to shoot it one day um so just never stop pushing it because just when you think like you've got it figured out which i did when i was like 24 i'm like i've pretty much mastered stand-up comedy and then you're like oh crap there's so many levels <laughs> there's so <laughs> many levels to this it's so deep so that's what I say now as an old person saying it to you. And I know in the back of your mind, you're like, whatever, I've got it figured out. <laughs> never stop writing and never stop polishing it. And never stop seeking. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. All right, we've got Elizabeth. What if I was just like, you're good. Just publish it now. Kill everyone. Get it done. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, a lot of your work includes like body positivity and feeling comfortable in your own skin. So I was wondering, um, like, did this, like the confidence that you have when you perform, you mentioned this also like having confidence and being comfortable. Do you feel like you had that before you started or like it's been just growing because you're on, you're on stage, you're always working and like why, how, how do you feel like this helps other people, I guess? Are you an actor? Makes sense, yes. I mean, because that's like a huge thing, like being connected to your body, you know, yeah. and the way people looking at your body. Two things. One, I came up in a time just from when I was growing up, when I was younger, where this wasn't as big of a conversation. It was just like, that person's fat, you're thin, whatever. Like it was a much more black and white conversation. Um, and I didn't ever have any body issues, but especially in like stand up. I don't think anybody was really paying enough attention to me mm -hmm. um, to criticize me. And I know that sounds like it's a weird thing to say. I've, al I've always existed in this place that was like known, but not super known. And so I was never like celebrities take like a lot of heat for the way that they look. And when you're a stand up and you're playing like the giggle bucket in Kansas city, like no one's really coming from that way. And you know, I'm, I'm in shape and I'm a blonde girl. And so that has its own reasons you get written off for. None as difficult as what many people go through. But I've always been just kind of positive, uh, just uh, um, and positive that I had the right answer just because being a comic means that you have this innate perspective that like what you have to say is right. Um, the body conversation, I kind of tweaked the stand up to reflect that because it became so part of being a woman just for this time that I was on earth, but it wasn't something that I thought about as much as young girls think about it now. Okay. When I was coming up, people have like a lot of shit that they have to deal with, but the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that it is because I'm confident, I want to sprinkle that on people, you know? And also you have to remember, nobody cares. Like as gross as you feel right now, we all feel gross. Nobody cares. Everybody's obsessed with themselves. And the sooner young girls can realize that it doesn't matter if you do that second coat of mascara or if you part your hair on the side or if you wear the wrong, like, it so doesn't matter. It's such a drop in our huge universe, the more freeing it will be. Um, you are never as ugly or as gross and as horrible, not even a fraction of it as you think you are. You are your own greatest enemy. Also online trolls, but they were raised by wolves, so whatever. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. I also played the improv, loved it, thank you. Yeah, I hope it opens again, yay! <laughs> Okay, we've got uh, Aria. Hi, um, my Hi, name Aria. is Aria. Can you see me? No. Oh, but that's okay. Okay, yeah, cool. To. Okay. Oh. Oh, now she's gone. Hold on a sec. I mean, I think we're doing pretty well, given how complex this is. Huh? Uh, okay, there we go. Cool. Um, 
So yeah, I'm a film production student at USC. I did a stand-up comedy class last semester, kind of really fell in love with it, um, have found enough success in it to, for me to kind of want to um, take my career as a stand-up comic further. And I'm trying to do more open mic nights and do the late night com comedy crawl around LA. And I was wondering, um, do you have any advice on how to approach and navigate that uh, for a new comic, you know, approaching the, because it is pretty intimidating and scary. How old are you? I can't see your face, so I can't really. I am. I'm not sure why you keep getting muted, but Aria, I can also try and um, ask you to start the video cool. if you want to give that a shot. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Red hair. I okay. See okay. Yes. How old are you? I am 20. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I don't know all the rules for the clubs for 21 and over, so that might make it tricky. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but let's say you can get in. A lot of comics will tell you that like a big part of it is hanging out. And the hangout, it's not this whole like supporting comics. Nobody cares about that. It's really about making those friends who may not be paid regulars at the improv or the comedy store because that's a separate thing, but they run shows and they run shows at those bars or at houses or whatever. So, you know, and I've seen people who aren't even, comedy attracts weird people. And you, you'll be like, where's that girl that had like the shaved head that hung out for three years on the patio? What happened to her? Like people kind of come in and out. There's always people for you to be friends with. Keep your head on your shoulders. Don't hang out beyond the show. Like you're not there to like get drunk and go back to a guy's house, whatever. You're there to work on your material. Find the people that are going to put you up and they're going to support you. Um, and treat it kind of like a job, you know, but have fun and be nice to everyone because the male comic ego is a very fragile thing. Wayne, I'm sure you know plenty of them. Um, and just kind of go, you know, you probably aren't going to get up for a while, but if you make friends with another comic who also just moved here and it's all about sort of networking and then you become, you find your class of comics, you know, it's, it's like high school. And then you all sort of come up together. There are plenty of all shows aside from the comedy shows, but you know, go to the comedy store if it ever opens again on a Saturday night, on a Friday night, on a Thursday night, go to the improv and just kind of be around because there's plenty of comics there who aren't getting up, but know people. Oh, you have a show? Oh, we run an alt show. And then you become part of the conversation. So just go right into it. Um, so kind of go so out as often as possible and like- Yeah, and it's tough because you're at school and you've got a life, you know, but it is, that is a big part of it. Just meeting those people and getting in. I mean, you'd be surprised the kind of comics who don't even, haven't even done that long that have access to showcases and different shows that have bigger comics just because they knew someone, you know? So being nice and gratiating yourself um, and being funny is probably the most important thing. But they will, you are allowed to be around comedy even if you're not funny. Plenty of people have careers in it. Um, but yeah, it's that hang. I personally never did it, but I had a very weird career path. Um, and making your friends and kind of sticking to those friends and you kind of, you'll come up together. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's right, a lot of work, get, but yeah, good luck. We're Thank getting you. near the end of the time. So maybe we can do a little more rapid fire on these final questions. Okay. Lightning That's round. Good. We're going to lightning round it. Let's go to I Anna. give long answers. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. You see me? Okay, there we go. Um, hi, I'm Emma Cantor. Um, I'm a senior theater major and my question is someone who's graduating and like is kind of, you know, a little terrified um, of the world we're going into right now, especially with yeah. all this going on. What do you think is the most important thing to look for in terms of representation? Like, do you think it's more important to be a big fish in a smaller pond or like go for the agencies with bigger yeah. names? Always. I think being the bigger fish in a small pond means you'll be catered to more. At the end, like there's, you don't have to worry about like packaging right now, which is we've got a writer that we want to put with your star and it's our agency because right. you at that level are not going to have access. Let's say, let's say by the grace of God, you get signed at CAA. You're not going to be on those lists or part of those conversations. I mean, unless you're brilliant, I just don't know you, but let's assume you're just a regular person. Um, you're not going to be in those conversations uh, until you get to a certain level. If you are the bigger fish in a smaller pond or a smaller agency, they're going to be working for you, hustling for you. You want that younger person that is hungry, um, that will get you those meetings, that will fight to get your, your name out there. 
Uh, and so if you aren't on a show and you don't have anything, you want someone that's constantly submitting you for stuff versus the big agent that's like, I didn't submit her, she wasn't. I had an agent who they used, like we had the big meeting. She's a huge agent. And I accidentally emailed her twice. And I got an email to my manager saying, I can't have Eliza bothering me this much. It's stressing me out. And it was two emails. They are crazy people. <laughs> and so just be aware that just because everybody says they're going to work for you, you want, go with your gut. Don't, don't be blinded by all the glitter and the big names and the people they bring in because they will bring in like the partners to the meetings. Ask them, say like, what is your plan? Right. You know, how, how are you going to promote me and, and do your research and take multiple meetings and get a bidding war going, you know, mm. but I say how big fish, years, small pond. How many years did you stay with your first representation and like building up your resume before you kind of switched? You know, because I was a stand up for me, it was more like, who's getting me those gigs that I want, who's actually doing it. And I will tell you, I had a very sobering moment. I will never forget this. I had been touring and I had a, a stand up agent and I had my manager forever and I looked at my calendar one day and I didn't have any gigs for like June and July. And I called my agent and I go, why am I looking at a blank calendar? Cause I'm sitting here head down, making my money, doing my gigs, building, building. And he goes, I'll be honest. I, uh, I just forgot to, uh, mm -hmm. look you. I did the tonight show that night in New York and on the way home, we called APA and I landed there, took the meeting, signed with them in the room. I never even told my other agent he was fired. I was like, figure it out. So, and I'm not with APA anymore anyways, but the point is get a manager tomorrow. You could get an agent tomorrow. You could get a manager that helps you find the agent. Your manager would help you find an agent. Um, it should, and they should always know that you're always on the brink of signing with someone else if they're not doing your job, just like you need to be doing your job. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank Don't you sleep. so much. Don't let them sleep on you, yeah. Super helpful, thank you. Good luck. Well, Thanks. I think that is it. I feel like my advice I... is so aggressive for all these children. But I know, so it's good, no, it's, it's good, really it's good. Wait, wait, can I ask one favor? Chelsea, who sure. is, uh, used to work for me, I, I, I would really hate her to have been cut off as the first person not to ask a question. Eliza, do you have one more minute? I got time. Okay. All right. If people want to ask more, I mean, it's okay with me, but I'm sure Wayne has things to do. Yeah, I'm busy. I'm very busy here in the middle of a global pandemic. All right, Chelsea, you'll be our last one. Hi. No, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Jeff. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really nice of you. And I am super, super starstruck. I adore your work, Eliza. So, and I'm a little oh. bit older. Can I just say all these girls are so freaking adorable in this call? Like, I can't even. I'm like 29. It's so cute. They're oh, so cute. Pretty young, but yeah, they're very cute. Very cute. <laughs> they're adorable. Um, yay. Shout out to Alex, who I did used to work for this program. So, um, Eliza, my first question for you is, what's your quarantine name, which is the last thing you ate and then your high school uh, must or your high school mascot, because that's funny. And then um, your podcast is amazing. And I'm wondering, um, my podcast, I interview comedians with deceased parents and siblings called dying of laughter so i love podcasts what advice do you have for aspiring podcasters and what kind of content do you like to listen to i'm curious at your taste level what you sure. enjoy listening to uh it's just funny yeah if you're giving advice to aspiring podcasters it's such a brand new medium of mostly people who can't do anything else and not many people make money at it but there are so many people that do it I think it's like, look, it's an honor to have people's attention. So what are you saying that other people can? And it could just be a point of view. It doesn't have to be facts, you know? Um, I, I, something that drives me crazy is when comedians have podcasts and they just talk over people. Like, we're all here for attention. Let's get that out of the way. We're all here because we don't have a TV show and we're trying to do another medium. But there is an art to a conversation. Um, so that would be my advice is making it a pleasant listening experience. And being unabashed about your take on things. We don't need another person making vanilla jokes and they're afraid to say anything politically incorrect, you know, really stamping it with your perspective. And you might not have one, which, you know, maybe you shouldn't have a podcast, but uh, the market will dictate. Who am I to say? Um, I don't listen to a ton of them because I have trouble listening to other people and I get restless. I listen to a lot of uh, EDM music by myself. But there is one podcast. I know I should say Revisionist History, and I look really smart. I listen to, when I'm on planes, Aaron Mankey's Lore. 
I love knowing random little historical tidbits and why things are the way they are and certain uh, historical facts and myths and stuff like that. Uh, so less fantastical and more uh, histor historically based. So I enjoy lore. Uh, that's probably the only one I listen to. I know that's so bad. I should have so many I should have movie podcasts, the friends podcast. Um, and my uh, quarantine name would be uh, Oatmeal Cookie Hornet. Multiple rage eating oatmeal cookie hornet. <laughs> Stress eating that's oatmeal amazing. cookie hornet. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're, You're awesome. welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. All right, let's do two. Let's do two more and get out of here. Do two more. All right. right. Okay. okay. All right, so we're in we're overtime. We're in fire. overtime. By the way, I know you guys are filming this, and some of my answers, I'm like, did that even make sense? Like, I feel like it's too aggressive for the children. <laughs> my head's like hot. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello, Kyra Brown. It is actually Kira, but it's okay. Kira. Not the first. <laughs> oh my God, uh, I know the feeling. I'm so sorry, Kira. I it's okay. I am also a big fan. I'm a comic. Um, I was wondering. Your advice for comics who want to end up as writers more so than like professional stand-ups, but are doing it as like a great way for comedy experience and to meet people. So advice more from the writing perspective. And also if I'm allowed to ask too, I always tell people you're my biggest comedy influence. So I'd be curious to know who your comedy influences are. Oh my are. God, I love that I'm older enough that I can be someone's comedy influence. Um, <clears throat> I'll answer that one second because that answer has been changing as of late, the more I like go into my quarantine to get to know myself. Um, because there are so many people that start out with comedy. I mean, it's odd. For, to me, it's so weird that people want to do, that you want to go through the pain of that and don't want to be a stand-up. But it's great for perspective and here, because so many writers, sometimes I read scripts and I'm like, did you say these words out loud? Because this is insane sounding. It's always good to have a holistic approach to comedy. Um, and the answer is always be writing, keep writing, find the comics that you like and be like, do you need a writer? Do you want to write a show together? If you hopefully if you have the right manager, they'll put you with someone and you can just like start pitching things, you know, writing spec scripts, you know, of course, you know what a spec script is. Um, so just doing that and just getting the practice of that. And of course, meeting people, maybe you're out there and you meet another girl and you're like, she's got what it takes. I would love to write something with her because a lot of comics don't write, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of writers don't do stand up. So um, just to keep doing it. I mean, that's it. That's what all this is, is just repetition and the odds being in your favor. Um, I think my greatest stand-up influence, it's not one thing. It's, it's just taking in people being the worst. I think that's my biggest, like I just, lately I've just been thinking about how much growing up in the 90s in Dallas, Texas has informed the way that I see the world. Like I'm a Jewish girl that lives in, uh, that lives in LA, but like deep inside me, there is a cheer coach. And like, even though I didn't cheer, like the awfulness of that, like, so it's just really the people that textured my upbringing, I think were the voices in the back of my head. I think that's the answer I'll go with for the next couple of interviews. I love yeah. Thank you. Happy and some of them. Happy Passover, season Pesach. Happy, happy Pesach. And some of them might even have a top knot. Might even have a top knot. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Anyway. All right, we All right got this one. is the last one. We'll this is the final mind. one. We'll get the dog for the final one. Okay, oh, good. You're chewing a cord? No! No, Mark you're getting your me shot. a <laughs> oh, Okay, let's do it. All right. So um, I'm wondering about your uh, comic timing uh, as it's different between stand-up and then doing this highly produced sketch comedy show. In particular, I was thinking of the Nectarines in the boardroom or Nashville names and the, these things that the, the timing of them, how long they go, you know, you really don't have the feedback to know if you've gone too far or, or when's it time to cut it off. So, yeah. and you know, what's important for comics timing, right? So. <laughs> um, so the question is what? Yeah. So the, the difference between your working oh, timing oh. for a stand up and doing timing on a highly produced skit show. Well, sure. I think it comes down to, uh, isolation versus collaboration you know in stand-up like you said you have that instant feedback and you know there is an art and an energy it's almost mathematical uh the way that you deliver a joke after years of doing it you can feel if it needs to be sped up or if it needs to go low and you start to play with that time and that energy at least i've been tapping into that lately not to get like too woo woo and metaphysical about it and sketch you know you still have your sense of timing you still understand 
the way a joke should be delivered, but you also have the soundboard of the other person in the scene. And while you don't have the instant feedback of the audience, people, I think, I don't think people who watch comedy realize that editing, good comedy lives and dies by the editing. And you get into a, a scene and you know it's gonna be awesome because you read it a billion times and you deliver the lines and it's not what it was. Editing can fix that. And by the same token, if you don't take enough air out of your sketch, it can just be awful because the editing was too slow. So a great comedy editor, I think, is very difficult to come by. And if you don't have that sense of timing as an innate thing, it will not be reflected in your sketch show. Because at the end of the day, like I have the last say on how that gets edited. So every single cut I was there for. Um, it's kind of, so yeah, because it's your baby. You want to cut up your baby. So that's it. It's, not, it's about not having instant feedback and knowing in your heart where those edits should be and then having to see it and then redo it all over again when it wasn't perfect. So it's multiple takes versus one take, which is what stand-up is. Well, Eliza, I just want to say yeah. thank you so much for doing this Q&A, these questions. We appreciate it. You have your sketch show on Netflix. You have five hours, over five hours. I feel like every year specials, hours. yeah, are over, are over an hour. I guess. Uh, and, and working on your sixth. And in that oh, movie, God. The Spencer Confidential, and you have a drama coming out, and a lot's happening. So thanks for taking time for doing all this. Alex, do you have anything, final thing to say? Just thank you guys so much. This, uh, this is our first attempt at a USC comedy event online. And um, uh, it just was really awesome to have both of you join us tonight and share all of that with our students. Thank you so much. And thank you, Wayne, for moderating this. And I'm happy to come back. I know we had so many people here. So thank you to all the little children who came out with their hopes and dreams. And thank you so much. All right, guys. Bye, you guys. Bye, guys. Go Trojans. <laughs> Got that right, right?